Man, we've all found ourselves in that point, right? We've all been in that situation. Maybe it wasn't a candle. Uh, maybe it was. I don't know. No judgment. But maybe it was uh, an assignment, or maybe it was a project for work or an assignment for class or an expectation put on us by a family member or someone we're dating or someone we're married to. Maybe it's something at some point in our life where we found ourselves in that moment where we could not meet someone else's expectation for us. We could not accomplish some particular task. We found ourselves lacking maybe the proper equipment or, or maybe the proper motivation or maybe the proper instruction to meet that expectation that was placed upon us. We feel this with family. We feel this with work and school and marriage. And sadly, many times we as believers feel this even towards God, towards our Heavenly Father. We get to a point where we feel like we know he wants us to live in a certain way or do a certain thing or speak these certain words, and yet we don't, and we find ourselves asking, man, why do I fail at this? Why am I failing? Well, maybe I don't have the proper instruction. Maybe I don't have the proper motivation. Maybe I'm not equipped to meet this expectation. How am I supposed to live a successful Christian life? What does God want from me, and how does he want me to accomplish it? I mean, that's a tension that we have all wrestled with and we'll all continue to wrestle with. It's a tension that Christians have wrestled with for years and years and years. And we've wrestled with it so much that we've actually put a word to describe it. We've used a word, a big Christian word called sanctification to describe that process. This process of, man, how do we live in a way that pleases the Lord? The Apostle Paul wrote on this in the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians. If you want to open up your Bible or if you have your app, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where we're going to start. We're going to be there in Philippians 2 this morning primarily. But what we see in 1 Thessalonians 4 is Paul addressing that tension, addressing that question that we often find ourselves asking, which is, how does God want me to live? Where's my instruction? Where's my motivation? Because many times when we lack those things, we find ourselves confused and frustrated with God because we don't know how to meet his expectation for us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul writes, Finally then, brothers and sisters... Now, this is a really crucial distinction that we need to make. Paul's specifically talking to, he's making this call to action, addressing it to a very specific group, namely brothers and sisters, meaning people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Paul calls them brothers and sisters because that's what Scripture tells us that we are with one another. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are now a part of the family of God. You're no longer a child of wrath. You're now a daughter or a son of the Lord Most High. And it's a beautiful thing. It's something that everyone gets to experience if you put your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. If I place my faith in Christ, I am suddenly getting to experience what we call justification, meaning I am justified, meaning I am made righteous in the eyes of God. Paul describes it in Romans 5, saying, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Another way to translate this would be, we have been justified by faith meaning I'm declared righteous, I'm declared right. I have good standing with the Lord. When the Lord looks at me, if I have placed my faith in Jesus Christ for the, forgiveness, for the forgiveness of my sins, when the Lord looks at me, he doesn't see my error, he doesn't see my failure, he doesn't see my faults and my insecurities. Instead, what he sees is the righteousness that Christ lived out. Jesus Christ, who stepped out of heaven and onto earth, to live and die and rise again for our sake, who lived that life of perfection that we could not live, who died that death that we deserved, all so that when he rose again after three days, that we could, if by faith, identify with him in that. I identify with Christ in his death. I identify with Christ in his resurrection. Because of those things, because of his act, I'm righteous. I have right standing. I can be in relationship with the God of the universe. Paul is saying, these are who I'm talking to, brothers and sisters, people who have been justified. But when we place our faith in Christ, we're more than just declared righteous. We also experience a change in who we are, something that we as believers have come to call restoration. Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 5, saying that so then if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What is old has passed away. Look, what is new has come. In other words, when I am 
justified, when I place my faith in Christ for the forgiveness of my sins, I don't just know that, oh, I have this new standing, this new identification, I'm now a son or daughter. I experience a change. I experience a transformation where justification is that switch from unrighteous to righteous. Restoration is a transformation of, from sin, slave to sin, to free in Christ. I'm no longer under sin. I'm no longer under the law. I'm now free in Christ. Now, a lot of us, though, we, we know that and we hear that, and maybe we've lived that out for a long time, and yet we know that even though I have this new creation, even though I have this new heart, even though I have these new desires, so often I still choose those old things. That's why we see in the book of Colossians really hammering on this idea of, man, when we as believers walk through life on a daily basis, we need to cast off this old self. We need to cast off these old ways. The analogy is of wearing it like a cloak. You take off the old self and you leave it and instead you choose the new self. And this is something that you do every single day. And yet so many times we as believers fail in that endeavor. We hold these, new, these two selves in tension and we want to choose one over the other and yet we fail so often to do so. And we have these and it's a struggle for many of us. Right? It's something that weighs on us. Something that can even turn us away from the Lord, can turn us away from his community. We have family members or friends who had some sort of tension, had some sort of sin or struggle in their life that they just simply couldn't overcome, and now they've just walked away from the faith entirely. We've seen this. But what we see in Scripture is a call to not fall away, but instead to embrace that tension. What we see in Scripture is a call to something better, than that failure. First and foremost, we need to realize that Paul is making this address. He's talking to these people about sanctification as a group, as a community. Right? He's saying, brothers and sisters, we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received instruction from us about how you must live and please God, that you do so more and more. He's specifically talking not just to Jim and Barbara or Bill and Susan or whatever. He's speaking to a community at large. All of these verbs, all these actions we see taking place in the Greek are, are plural. This is, this is y'all received instruction. Y'all must live. If Paul was from Waco, that's how he would write it. Right? Y'all got to live this way, dadgum. Right? That's what he would say. He's speaking to a group of believers because what we need to realize first and foremost is that any sanctification that's going to occur in our life, any sort of change that's going to occur, any success we want to find in Christian life is contingent upon us being in community. The Lord has designed us for community, to be surrounded with people. That's why a lot of times New Year's resolutions fail. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into the failure of people to get fit or make resolutions. And there have been a lot of studies on it, but I was reading one in particular that was talking specifically about people getting in shape and wanting to make sure that they you know, got healthy and started eating right. People would say, I'm going to run 20 miles a day. I'm going to eat kale exclusively. Like, I'm going to do all these things. And so many times those people will fail. Maybe some of us have failed in those endeavors. And one of the major factors in that, according to a, current, uh, a particular study, is an ice, the fact that we get isolated. The fact that we don't do it in community. What they found is as they looked at a, across a wide variety of people, there was much greater success and follow through on those sorts of resolutions, on those sort of let's get healthy endeavors or goals for people that were doing it with a friend or with a group of friends or with their office or with their spouse or whoever it is. That's why a lot of times people go to gyms because deep down we kind of know like, oh, maybe I need to be a part of something. I need to go to the gym and get that trainer named Blazer and he's going to come help me. He's yeah, let's do this. And he's going to coach me through all those steps and those sit-ups or whatever it is because we know deep down, I mean, we need people to live properly. Paul is starting this off, this address to these people, these brothers and sisters. He says, you're going to be doing this. What I'm about to describe is for you as a community. So if you don't have community, you need to look for it. I would encourage you this brand new year. I mean, we've got so many different communities you can be involved with here at Grace. Guff talked about a few at the beginning. If you're dealing with grief and, and things of that nature, we have grief share programs. If you're just looking for a kind of a walk with people in daily life sort of thing, we have, we have home groups and Bible studies available any night of the week for people of all stages of life. 
I would encourage you to look online. Find a community, a group of people where you can get involved, where you can be plugged in, where you can live in a way that pleases God. Because that's what we're called to, to live in a way that pleases God. This is what sanctification is. That's why Paul says, you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That's what he's been describing, your sanctification. Another way you could translate that would just be your, or the, you being made holy, that you would be made holy. This is the desire of God, that you would be made holy, that you would be set apart. Biblical holiness is this idea of being set apart for a special, for a special purpose. So Paul says, I mean, that, that's the desire for God, of God for you, that you would be set apart, that you would be sanctified. That your Christian story wouldn't end when you put your faith in Christ and are justified and restored. But that would be the beginning of your story. That you would then continue to live on and be sanctified in life. That you would be made holy and set apart. But how does that really work? How does that practically play out? Thankfully, we have Philippians chapter 2 where Paul spends a lot of time talking about, kind of elaborating on this idea of sanctification, on what it looks like practically for a believer to be set apart and made holy. Philippians 2, chapter 2, verse 12, he starts off talking again to a group of believers. My dear friends, just as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, continue working out your salvation with awe and reverence. So what we see is Paul is putting some kind of legs on that idea of being sanctified, being made holy. He says essentially what it is is it's a working out of your salvation. You need to work out your salvation. Now the wording here is very, very particular, both in English and in Greek. What we're not seeing here is an idea of working for your salvation or working to obtain your salvation. That would be abundantly clear if Paul was using that verbiage, if the Lord was inspiring through the Holy Spirit, through Paul, to write that. I mean, we would see it, but we don't see that. Instead, what we see in this text is the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul, letting us know that we are called to work out our salvation. In other words, to put our salvation into use, to use it, to use that free gift that we've been given. January 9th, 2010, Susan Walters and Jacob Smith stood on a stage much like this one, said vows to each other, and got married. It's my wedding anniversary. It's coming up again. I guess I better think about that. I hadn't thought about that until right now. But we have an anniversary right of that moment where we got married. We signed the papers, and we said the vows. We put the rings on each other's fingers, had the ceremony, did all that stuff. It was a wonderful day, January 9th, 2010, one of the best days in my entire life. But that wasn't the end of my marriage, right? That was the beginning of that relation. That was the beginning of that new chapter of my life. And sure enough, from January 9th and onward, we, Susan and I started living differently. We started acting differently, speaking differently. Uh, we, one of the first things we did as a married couple is we uh, moved in together, right? So a lot of married people do that. I highly recommend it. It's really great. It helps a lot uh, with your communication. And we... Moved, we started living together. We merged our things. We merged our bank accounts. Susan changed her name from Susan Walters to Susan Smith. We merged all of our possessions. Suddenly, I went from like no spoons to owning so many spoons. And it was so great, man. I'll never go back. It's amazing. Spoon life, I'm telling you. But we did these things. We lived differently. We started to enjoy brunch more because, you know, we're married. And we started to, we, when we first wanted to have a child, we, we bought a dog, right? Because that's what you do when you're newly married. And then you have a baby, and then you still have the dog. And you're like, dang, what? Dog? And, but anyway, but we had this life that changed. Because of that moment, we got married, and that relationship started to play itself out in a lot of different arenas. People now realize, oh, you're married. You're you're different now. You act differently. You speak differently. You live differently. God is saying, I want you to be different. If you're a Christian, if you've been justified, if you've been restored, if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you truly believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you really have a relationship with me, I want you to be different. I want you to work that out. I want you to put it into use. And I want you to do this out of love. 
not out of fear, right? A lot of times we take something like this and we make it about fear. We, we look inward and we think, oh, I need to secure my salvation or, or obtain, maybe, you know, really get my salvation for real. And that's not what he's talking about. The Lord always calls us to live and act out of love, not out of a selfish fear, but out of a selfless love for him because we have a relationship with him. He's our father. And any healthy relationship sees both parties looking to serve each other, to better each other, to do things for the, for the betterment of the other individual. That's how healthy relationships work. That's why we see elaborate engagement stories, much like this one. Is this romantic or totally insane? Okay, a little crazy. A man stops traffic on one of the busiest highways in the country to propose to his girlfriend. That's Interstate 45 in Houston with traffic backing up behind him. The couple's family and friends all stopping, getting out of their cars to catch the moment. You can't hear the woman say yes because there are too many horns blaring in the background, but she says yes. But I'm late for a meeting. Wow. So this was a few weeks ago in Houston on I-45. This one dude, I've looked into it, this one guy, he decided, you know what, I'm ready to take this relationship to the next level. And I think the best place to do that is on I-45 <laughs> here in Houston. So he gathered a bunch of his friends, they drove all together, and they lined up their cars on I-45 and just stopped traffic and so that he could get out and propose. Apparently it was something to do with the skyline or whatever, that's crazy. But he proposed. She said, yes. He's now actually, just so you know, facing criminal charges. He could, he could be in jail for six months uh, because you can't do that. You can't obstruct a highway. Uh, but what we see in moments like that is some guy trying to improve the life of the girl, right? Like, and she, you know, maybe that's a story that they'll always love and cherish. I don't know. That could be the start of a really beautiful engagement. I don't know. We do that in our lives. We want to work and serve that for that other person in our life, that, that man or that woman, that person that we want to love and, and cherish, that, that spouse or that, that brother, that sister, that mom, that dad, that son, that daughter, that friend. I mean, we know that healthy relationships see both parties working to love and serve each other. That's all God wants from us. That's all he calls us to. He says, I want you to have a healthy relationship with me. If you fail, it doesn't mean that I'm going to abandon you. It doesn't mean that you're no longer mine or you were never truly mine to begin with. That's, that's not it. Failure just means that our relationship won't be quite as healthy, which is unfortunate. But it's not going to destroy your life. God says, I want you to live in a way that pleases me. I want you to be sanctified. I want you to work out your salvation. If justification and restoration are my birth, sanctification is my growth. It's a process that we enter into in community. And the truth is that a lot of us, we've wanted a healthy relationship with God. I mean, we, we would say that. We would, we would confess that. We'd say, man, I want a healthy relationship with the Lord, and yet I still find myself struggling to live in that way. I find myself struggling to live out 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1, to live in a way that pleases God. Sometimes it's because we feel as if it's too much of a burden to take that on, to put that on our plates. We feel maybe like it's an unobtainable goal. We've failed so much in the past. We're like, I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to reach that. I'm never going to be like him or her. I'll never reach that level. So why would I even try? Maybe we feel too busy. We think I've got a lot on my plate right now. I've got all these things to do. I just need to get this in line. I need to make sure my kids go do this and this and that. And I need to make sure that I get this done at work or this done with my spouse or whatever it is. We feel like, man, there's just not enough time in my life to dedicate more to the Lord, to really be concerned about that. We feel like, man, I've failed so badly. The Lord's given up on me. Or maybe it's been so long since I've lived in that way or tried those things that I don't even know where to start. We've all have struggles. We all have resistances to that call to live in a way that pleases God. So how do we overcome them? How do we push through them? What do we do? What do we say that will just destroy those struggles? Say when we look in Scripture for a way to solve those issues, to resolve that tension, to overcome those struggles... The only answer that we find in God's word is that we can't. 
we can't do that. But thankfully, we worship a God who can. For the one bringing forth in you both the desire and the effort for the sake of his good pleasure is God. It's God. We're called to live in such a way and act in such a way. We're called to say those certain words and do these certain things. And yet God knows that in the midst of that call, in the midst of that expectation, we in and of ourselves cannot do it. We don't have the proper desire. We don't have the proper effort. We don't have the right affections and we don't have the right abilities to live in a way that pleases God. So God himself will bring it forth in us. That's what scripture promises us. We can't in and of ourselves just fix our lives. We in and of ourselves can't just decide to live in a way that pleases God, but he has promised to equip us. He's called to be, or he has promised to be strong where we're weak. He's promised to change our affections, to bring forth in us the desire, the proper desire to love him. Because the reality is that, man, humanity's always failed at this. You look at Adam and Eve in the garden, they're known for their failure. Even God's chosen people of Israel, the Jews of our Old Testament, when we look at those people and God looked down, he, said, he looked at Abraham, he says, I'm going to use you and your descendants to change the world, to save the world. And he raised up these men and these women and he had this chosen nation. He said, I'm going to work through you and people are going to look at you and they're going to see me and it's going to be this incredible relationship and I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And yet those Israelites were known for their failure. They failed time and time and time and time again until the moment where God eventually just sits down with the nation of Israel. Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, God is looking across the table at the nation of Israel and they're having that kind of rough relationship conversation that maybe some of us have been in. Some of us were sitting down at that table or on that bench and we looked across the other person we were dating and they looked at us and they said, you know what, it's not going to work out. But it's not you. It's me, right? I'm just not ready to be in a, I'm in a relationship right now. Like, I've just got a lot of cats or whatever. Like, I just, I can't do this thing. So we need to just, you know, it's not you, it's, it's me. So God's looking at the nation of Israel across the table. But instead of the whole, it's not you, it's me thing, God looks at the nation of Israel and he says, hey, it's you. Oh, <laughs> goodness, it's you. It's all you. You are the sole problem in this relationship. But, but, I'm not going to break up with you. But this relationship is not over. Instead, God looks to the nation of Israel. He tells them, you are so broken. You're so flawed. You're so full of failure. And I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix you. God promises in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 passages that we now call the new covenant or passages that talk about what we now call the new covenant where God says that I'm going to give you a new heart, a new mind, new affections. He says, literally, I will put my law within them and on their hearts. I'm going to change the very fabric of who you are. I'm going to bring forth in you the proper affections and desires. I'm going to bring forth in you the proper abilities and effort so that you can live in a way that pleases me. Man, that's a beautiful thing. It's something that many of us have experienced on different levels, where maybe an affection that we have was shaped by a parent or a family member or a friend. My daughter, Charlotte, one of her favorite things in the entire world is food. Uh, Many of us, I mean, I'm on board with that. And so we love eating food in our house. She will eat a wide variety of foods. Uh, as seen here, she also loves to smear them on her face. Another great thing to do, just so you know. But we, she loves, maybe above all other foods, one of her favorite things to eat is celery. She loves celery sticks, uh, which my wife is not on board with. But I love because... She and I share that. Charlotte loves celery sticks. She loves to get celery sticks. You can hand her a celery stick, and she'll just like jam it in her mouth like a big old stogie and just crawl around the house all day because I love celery sticks. I love eating celery, and so that's why we had it in the house to begin with. That's why she, she saw me eating it, and so she wanted to try it. She loves celery because I love celery, and many of us have that thing, right? We still eat that food, or we still watch that show, or we love that movie, or we love that activity because our parents loved it, or because our siblings loved it, or our friends loved that. We find ourselves having our affections shaped 
and molded by the people around us. God says, I'm going to change your affections to match my own. But I'm not only going to bring forth in you that special affection, I'm going to bring forth in you the proper ability. I'm going to equip you for success. He's promised us the Holy Spirit. That's why Romans 8 tells us that we should be walking by the Spirit. That's why Galatians tells us that we should exhibit fruit of the Spirit. If I want to display in my life love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, or self-control, Scripture is very clear that, man, I can't bring those out on my own. I have to rely on the Lord. Those are fruit of the Spirit, meaning the Spirit is the source of that fruit, of those attributes. Charlotte, in and of herself, cannot go get celery. She's a baby. Babies can't buy celery, I don't think. She can't do it. I have to give it to her. But you know what? I can't even just, like, give her celery in and of myself. I have to go to H-E-B, from whom all blessings flow, right? (laughs) I have to go to H-E-B. You know what? Even H-E-B itself, even as magnificent as it is, they can't in and of themselves produce celery. They have to go to farmers, people who grow celery from the earth, from seeds, They have to go and gather that celery to bring to the store to give to me so that I can give it to Charlotte. We have to go to the source to obtain that vegetable. God says there's things in life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, those attributes, those wonderful things that I want to see in your life, they're not in you. They're not in and of you. You can't produce love in and of yourself. You have to rely on the spirit, the true source of love joy of peace. It says any believer receives that indwelling spirit who can enable us to not only have the proper affections, but also the proper abilities to live in a way that pleases God, to live that lifestyle that Paul described in 1 Thessalonians 4 of pleasing God. So in other words, this process of sanctification, one of the best ways I heard it described is it's, it's not activism, but it's also not apathy. Meaning it's not something that I can just in and of myself decide, I'm going to get holy. I'm going to set myself apart and I'm going to do this. I can't do that. That's not how sanctification works. That's not how my holiness comes about. But it's also not through apathy. Meaning that I just sit back and I'm like, hey God, I guess make me holy or whatever. So they, you know, that's not how it works. Instead, what we see is this tension. We see this, this weird tension the sweet spot in the middle where we're not being activists, we're not being apathetic, but instead we're somehow positioning ourselves to allow the Lord to work through us. So how do we do that? Thankfully, that's where Paul goes in Philippians chapter 2. That's what he explains. He gives three very basic principles for how do we position ourselves to allow the Spirit to work through us. First and foremost, he says in verse 14 that we need should be doing everything without grumbling or arguing. And he's not saying this because he was tired of hearing, you know, kids in the back seat cry about how they're touching each other's seat belts. Like, that's not his motivation. Instead, he's saying you need to be doing everything without grumbling or arguing. Because when we grumble and when we argue, what that does is it displays in us, it displays that we are so prideful. What it does is it displays a lack of humility in our hearts. So if we're going to be allowing the Lord to work through us, the first thing we need to destroy is our pride. The first thing we need to get rid of is that selfish, prideful attitude that's so common, that crops up in our lives so often. So I would challenge you to ask yourself, man, where in your life do you often complain? Where's your rough patch? Is it something with work? Is it with a certain coworker, a certain family member? Is it that has to do with a certain area of life, like the way you handle money or the, the health of a family member or a friend for yourself? Where is it that you often find yourself complaining and grumbling. Because where that's occurring, I'm telling you, there's probably pride mixed in with that. There's some sort of selfish pride of, I think the world should be this way, or I think people should behave that way. And if they're not doing that, that's wrong, because it doesn't line up with what I think. Find where you grumble. Find where you complain. I would encourage you to counter it with thanksgiving. Ask the Lord to help you be mindful of, maybe make a list of what you can be thankful for in those areas. That maybe the, the way money's worked out in, right now in your life isn't quite where it wants to be. That bank account's not quite the number you want it to be. But, man, you can be thankful for so much that the Lord has provided. 
Maybe that one relationship's not going the way that you quite expected it to go, but I'm sure there's still so much that the Lord has given you that you can be thankful for other relationships, certain things in that particular relationship. If we grumble and complain, we're showing pride in our lives, and it's too often we can miss God's plan because we're caught up in our own pride. So Paul says, man, get that out. Another practical thing to do is to be blameless and pure, children of God without blemish, through you, or though you live in a crooked and perverse society in which you shine as lights in the world. Right? Which at first seems very, very uh, lofty of a goal. Like, oh, it's easy, just be perfect. Like that, but that's not it. When Paul is using this word blameless, the, the Greek word we see here is not this idea of someone who is perfect without blemish. What instead we see is someone who owns up to their issues, who owns up to their problems. Right? Before God, we are without blemish because he sees the righteousness of God, right? Because we are, or of Christ, because we have been justified. But to the world around us, we're not going to appear perfect, but we can be blameless, meaning people who own up to their faults, who ask for forgiveness where they need to ask for forgiveness, people who are quick to apologize, people who are quick to be humble, people who are quick to listen, who don't just seek to defend themselves. And because too often our, our, our reaction to our own faults and, and failures isn't necessarily the best. A lot of times we like to just sort of sweep it under the rug. A lot of times we think, you know what, maybe I ripped up that pillow, but maybe if I don't look at it, uh, no one will really notice, right? Or they'll just kind of forget about it. Or you think, you know, I had so much fun with that potting soil, but I got it all over the deck. Uh, but maybe if I just don't look at it, people will just forget about it, right? We'll move on and we don't have to deal with it. It's not what God calls us to. He says, no, I want you to be blameless. I want you to be people who own up to their faults. And in doing so, you will shine as lights to the world. People will notice how different you are. Because ultimately, God wants us to be distinct from the world around us. He wants us to behave as children, his children, not the world's children. He says, I want you to be different. I want you to be distinct. So ask yourself, I mean, where do you lack that distinction? Is it in a certain environment? Is it in a lie that you maintain, a relationship that you have that's just toxic? Is it a habit that you can consistently fall into? Where do you lack distinction from the world around you? Because the Lord wants you to be different. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be set apart. The Spirit will empower you to do that. The Spirit will convict you of where that is in your life and can work through you to, to make you more distinct. But ultimately, what we need to recognize and remember is that all of these things, whether we're trying to stay humble, whether we're trying to stay distinct, trying to stay blameless, is it all is dependent upon holding on to the word of life. By spending time with the Lord and his word. That's why Colossians 3 tells us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And again, this is not just addressed to Jim or Sue or Bob. This is addressed to the church. This is addressed to believers. This is addressed to the body of Christ. This is something that needs to be sought after in community. The word of God has the power to inform us and influence us. And God has given it to us to enjoy in community. So again, I mean, where are you plugged in? Is there a Bible study, a home group? Is there some sort of smaller, more intimate environment where you're known? Because that's crucial. It's crucial to living in a way that pleases God. That's why this morning we're going to take communion. As the men are going back and preparing it, uh, I would encourage you to just remember that communion is it's, it's a beautiful reminder for us. It's an illustration. It's a picture for the church to enjoy. That we would take these elements, that we would eat the little cracker, drink the little juice, that we would do those things not as some way to obtain or secure our salvation, but that it is instead a way for us to remember what Christ has done so that we're more mindful of what he's currently doing. And we take communion as a body. It's something that Scripture has always addressed to us as a group, as a community. The Lord wants us to, when we get together to take communion, to remember him in that way. Because again, the Lord is calling us to live in a way that pleases him. And the first step towards that is being in a community of people who want to live in a way that pleases him. So as we take this communion, as we take these elements, I would encourage you to, as we're passing the plates and all that good stuff, that you would just sort of take a moment and ask the Lord to show you and where 
Where is it that you're lacking distinction? Where is it that you know the Lord wants to set you apart and make you holy? Where is it that maybe you're crippled by guilt, or by pride? Where is it that maybe that you, you've made these mistakes and you haven't quite owned up to it? Where is it that maybe you've neglected to spend time with the Lord in prayer and his word? I encourage you as we have these next few just sort of quiet moments to, to dwell on that, to ask the Lord, to ask the Spirit to convict you. you know, where, what kind of steps can you take this week for this brand new year? What's the resolution you can set? that time that you'll spend with the Lord and his word, that person you need to talk to right after church to confess your sin, to ask for forgiveness. The Lord wants to change us and wants to set us apart. He only calls us to make ourselves available to that. So let's go before him right now. God, we, we thank you that you have called us to a life that's not dependent upon our own work, our own success, because God, we're gonna fail and fail and fail. Lord, we thank you that instead you've promised to provide what you expect. That, God, you've promised to change our affections, God, to change our abilities. Lord, we thank you that you've already accomplished all those things that we could not do in and of ourselves. Lord, you died the death we deserved. You lived the life we couldn't live. Lord, you've offered us this beautiful free gift of salvation by faith. God, that's incredible. So if you would take that moment right now and, and ask the Lord, and sh God, show me where is it that you want me to be distinct? Lord, where are you wanting to sanctify me? Which relationship or, or which workplace or which class or which family member, which friendship? Where is it exactly, Lord, that you want to set me apart by keeping me blameless or keeping me humble, by drawing me into your word. Ask him to reveal that to you right now. God, we thank you for this wonderful illustration that Jesus Christ would break his own body, that he would spill his own blood all for our sake. Lord, that sacrifice is something that is beyond our comprehension. God, that, that God would die for us. Lord, it, it doesn't make sense. So we thank you for that beautiful mystery. God, we thank you that you revealed parts of yourself that we can understand, that we can grasp. Lord, we thank you that even when there are tensions in our life, like, like the new and old self, Lord, like this struggle to live in a way that pleases you while we still have conflicting desires and conflicting affections, Lord, we, we thank you that you've always promised to be with us in those moments. That, Lord, that there's nothing in this world that we need to fear because you've overcome it. God, thank you for that promise. Thank you for your faithfulness even though we all fail. So Lord, be with us this week, God, as we step out into a new year, a new week, a new day, Lord, that you would, you would embolden our steps, and God, you would give us opportunities to be lights to the world around us, that people would look at us, they would see something different, the Lord, it would compel them to want to know the God that we love. So Lord, work through us. We pray these things according to your will. Amen.